Hello, and welcome to part nine in the module providing a case study of Gang of Four patterns. In recent parts of this module, we've talked about a number of patterns for building an expression tree processing application. We talked about patterns for tree structure and access, the composite and bridge pattern. We talked about patterns for tree creation, interpreter and builder. We talked about patterns for tree traversal, the iterator, prototype, and visitor patterns. We talked about patterns for commands and factory, the abstract factory and factory method patterns and the command pattern. And now we're going to talk about a pattern for being able to order the processing of commands when run by users. The purpose of this particular pattern is to be able to ensure that the user commands are performed in the appropriate order. There's a number of classes that are involved in this discussion, and they all play a part in different pieces of the state pattern. The state pattern's purpose in this context is to be able to bake into the design of the classes the ordering in which user commands are allowed. So let's talk a bit about motivating the problem here. What problem are we trying to solve? Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to ensure that users interact with our expression tree processing app by running commands in the right order. In other words, we want to make sure they obey the protocol of command ordering. Uh, here's an example. We might start out and we might run the command processing app, the, the command processing portion of our expression tree app. And what would show up on the screen if we ran it in verbose mode would be a menu of commands. And if we went ahead and typed the format command and said we want to read in the format using in order, and then we tried to print right after that, that would be a good example of some kind of protocol violation because we can't go ahead and do a print until we've actually given an expression to be built into an expression tree. So the constraints and forces here is that we can't run these commands in just any order. We have to run the commands in an order that obeys the protocol. So in this particular case, format must be the first thing to be called. The expression or expr command must be given uh, before print or eval is called, but after format. And once you've gotten an expression to, to process, then eval or print can be called in any order. And at any point, you can also go back and make another expression. So these are the different ways in which you can interact with the program in correct order. Now, it turns out that the solution here is to encapsulate command history, which is very important to figure out the right order in which to run things, as states in a state machine. So as we'll see here, as we get into this a little bit more deeply, the legal order of commands depends on the commands that have preceded any given command. And we can represent this in terms of a state machine, uh, state flow diagram. So here's an example of, of such a diagram. Uh, when things start out, we're in an uninitial, uninitialized state. That's the first state in our state flow. And when someone types the format command, that transitions us, because it says now you can read in the input in in order, or post order, or pre order, or whatnot. And we go into a new state, which is the um, order uninitialized state. This says we've given the appropriate order we want the input to be read. At that point, you can then go ahead and make a tree. Uh, and when you make the tree, in other words, when you give it the expression to evaluate, it goes ahead and creates the tree, and then it transitions into the order initialized state. And at that point, you can go ahead and print and eval and make new trees and so on. If you don't see a line with a command on it, then that's considered to be an invalid state. If you try to invoke an operation that doesn't make sense based on the state that you're in, you'll get some kind of error or exception from the program. Now, the way in which the solution works is we take that state machine and then we bake that into the way in which the classes are structured. And we use inheritance and dynamic binding to make this all work effectively. So if you take a look at this class diagram here on the slide, you'll see that we have a, a class inheritance hierarchy that mimics, in some sense, the states in the state machine. We have something that's the base class called ET state. And then we inherit from that something called uninitialized state. And that corresponds to the uninitialized state in the state machine. And then we go ahead and inherit from that the various order uninitialized states. And there's pre-order, in-order, level order, and uh, uh, post-order, different uninitialized states. And then after something else happens and the transition occurs correctly, we're then in the initialized states. 
pre-order, post-order, level order, in order, and so on. And these are reflected in the hierarchy of the classes themselves. Uh, as always, we use the bridge pattern to simplify access to all this variability and to be able to simplify memory management. Here is one of the key classes in this particular design. This is called the expression tree context class, or ET context class. And this is the interface that's used to ensure that commands are invoked according to the correct protocol. Now, one of the things you'll see here that's quite interesting is that the interface that you see on the screen has a bunch of methods that correspond pretty much one-to-one -to, -one to user commands. So you have the format method that corresponds to the format command. You have the make tree method that corresponds to the expr or expression input command. You have the print method that corresponds to the print command and so on and so forth. And so from a commonality and variability point of view, we have a way of having a fixed interface of the various commands you can run, but then we're going to vary the behavior of the implementation depending on what the state that we're in is going to end up being. And as you can see here, this particular class also uh, has a way of being able to keep track of state information. Now, ET context is essentially a bridge that ends up pointing to the ET state hierarchy. So ET state is a class that defines the implementations of the various states. <clears throat> and as we'll see here, we'll have an ET state class with many of the same methods that we saw before, except they're all going to be virtual. And in addition to being virtual, they're also going to take a first parameter to every method, which is a reference to the context in which that particular state method was called. And this is something that's called delegation. And we'll see in a, just a bit how it works in a more concrete way. So again, from a commonality and variability point of view, we have a common interface, things like format, make tree, uh, print, evaluate, and so on. And those are fixed, they're common. And then we're going to be able to vary the behavior of what those operations do based on the state that we happen to be in. And naturally, the secret sauce here is going to be by subclassing from the ET state class and then filling in different behaviors for those different virtual methods in different ways. The whole pattern that guides this type of design is a gang of four pattern called state. It's an object behavioral pattern. And the intent of this pattern is to allow an object to appear to alter its behavior when its internal state changes. Its interface doesn't ch change at all, but its behavior changes. And the object, in some sense, almost appears as if it's changing its class because its behavior will be different. If you call the format method or the make tree method in different states, you'll get very different results. You should consider applying this particular pattern under a number of circumstances. Uh, you should apply it when an object has to change its behavior at runtime, depending on which state it's in. And we'll see this in a second when we look at the example. You might also do this when several operations have some large multi-part conditional structure that, whose behavior and, and actions depend on the object's state. This slide also illustrates the structure of the solution. Uh, as you can see, we have a context class, which is, in our case, the expression tree context, or ET context. And then you have a pointer to a, an object that points to a base class, which in this case is the ET state class, or more generally, the state class in the pattern. And then you have a number of different concrete states that inherit from that base class. In our case, these would be the uninitialized state, pre-order initialized state, post-order initialized state, in-order uninitialized state, and so on and so forth. And of course, this is just the magic of object-oriented design and programming. When the context makes a method call, it'll be dispatched through a pointer to the ET state object when, in fact, it'll be calling down to some subclass through dynamic binding and virtual functions and so on. Here's a simple example that shows how we might apply this pattern in our expression tree processing application. We're going to use this pattern to allow the ET context object to alter its behavior when its state changes. So here's, here's how it might work. Uh, notice that the ET context make tree method, when it's called, will turn around and say state make tree, and it passes the context object, it passes this in as the first parameter, and then it also passes in the expression that's being asked for the tree to be made for. Now, if you've made this call and the context object was in the wrong state, if it was in the uninitialized state, you can see what happens here. Uh, in this particular case, it's going to throw an exception because it's not appropriate 
for make tree to be called when we are in the uninitialized state. And you'll also notice how the contexts make tree method delegates itself down to the state uh, method. And we'll see why it does that in just a second. Here then is the same example, except now let's assume that we are in the in order uninitialized state. We would be in this state after somebody had told us, uh, for example, to, to input the, the input in in order format. So we'd be in that state. Now, when make tree is called through the context, something quite different is going to happen. What will happen in this context is it'll go ahead and take the expression that was passed in and then it'll use the right interpreter, in this case the in order interpreter, to parse through that expression, build up a parse tree using the interpreter and builder pattern, and then convert that into the composite pattern, uh, and then stick, stick that together with the particular way of doing the bridge to get back an expression tree. <clears throat> and what you'll see in this particular case when, when this happens is that the state will then change. If you take a look at the very bottom of this slide, you'll see that we transition from being in the in-order uninitialized state to the in-order initialized state, which means that we now have an expression tree that corresponds to the expression that was taken in there. So the main thing to remember here is that depending on the, the state when the context make tree method is called, different things are going to happen. And yet the interface to the outside, to the application client, remains unchanged. It's the internals that change as the state evolves. So some of the consequences of this pattern, it tends to localize state-specific behavior and it partitions behavior for different states. In our case, we have different behaviors for different methods, make tree, format, eval, print, and so on, based on the state that they happen to be in at the time. It can also be used to make the state transitions explicit, as you saw in the previous slide. When we got done with successfully parsing the tree and building the composite node hierarchy, we then transition into a new state. You can also share these state objects by using various kinds of reference counting to reduce the amount of memory used in the program and the amount of time required to copy things when we're using STL containers and algorithms and so on. There are some downsides. One of the big downsides is there's lots of subclasses. And these subclasses can be difficult to follow. And the state transitions, to some extent, get hard-coded into the implementation. Speaking of implementation, there's a number of different ways to define and implement this pattern. Uh, one of the main things to do is to ask the question, who defines the state transitions and when those transitions occur? Is that baked into the implementations of the methods? Is there some kind of external table that you can use to tell you what state to transition to? Uh, if you have very complicated state machines, you probably want to use more of a table-based state management system than using the state pattern. Uh, if you're building a protocol for a complex system, for example, like TCP IP, this may be too complicated to do by hand. And then there's the issue of creating and destroying the state objects. Who creates them? Who destroys them? Uh, do you do some kind of you know, free list or garbage collection? Or, or what is done to make sure that these resources are reclaimed properly? There's a number of interesting implementations of this pattern. One of my all-time favorites appeared in a, an article many years ago, from about, about 20 years ago or so, by Ralph Johnson and, and one of his grad students talking about using the state pattern in the context of implementing a protocol machine for TCP IP. And uh, it's a little hard to come by this article, but if you get a chance to read it, it gives a real nice motivation and explanation of the state pattern in a compelling network-centric type of application environment. And then some of the drawing tools that are available, Unidraw, Hotdraw, also use the state pattern internally to keep track of the various modes and operational conditions of the system. So to wrap up this particular discussion, the state pattern gives you a way of being able to ensure user commands are processed in the right order. And it does it by essentially baking in the state transitions into the structure of the software design. And so in some sense, the use of inherits and a dynamic binding mimics the way in which the state transitions occur. And depending on the complexity of your solution, that can make it easier to write code that can do the right thing based on the state it happens to be in.